And now, broadcasting from the bar in some random guy's basement, your hosts, Dean Winch and Jason Johnson. Hello folks, welcome to Brunology, the podcast. Fusion of beer and knowledge. I'm your host, Dean Winch. With me tonight is Jason Johnson. How are you doing tonight, Jason? Doing okay. How are you doing? I'm all right. Loving the weather. Uh, I'm not a lover of the cold weather, so this is right up my alley. November, 70 degrees, 65 degrees. But you're living in Wisconsin. you gotta, you got to be used to the cold weather. Well, I'm used to it. doesn't mean I have to like it. Yeah, true. true. But, I'm yeah. not a big fan of snow blowing or any of that, but yeah, it's been nice. Yeah. I, and, I hope uh, when, the, when the people listen to this, I hope we still have some nice weather. And, I mean, as long as we don't have that, that white crap on the ground. Yeah, you never know. It's going to be, we're going to put this out three weeks after recording, so yeah. we might have some snow on the ground. Oh, there, now you said it. Late late November? Now you said it. Way well, to go. Blame him, everybody. The deer hunters want that anyway, so. Yeah, I do have a couple of brothers who deer hunt, and I am hoping for some venison, and if they're listening, yes, that is a hint. <laughs> so, if you want the, if you want that white stuff, and, and we'll, we'll trade that for, uh, for some venison. That's a fair trade, I think. Uh, any new brewing news? <laughs> I do. Actually, um, I recently got my hands on the 10 gallon stainless infusion mash tun from SS Brew Tech. Um, I got to use that and I uh, got to play with it with my, with my system a little bit and brewed up a beer to get used to it. And I, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, it's, um, it's got, uh, no dead space because you have the, you have a drain in the center, which is really nice. We've got the false bottom on top. And it's it's plenty big, as you can see. I've got it actually sitting next to us here. So if you're a, a five gallon brewer or so, then uh, five gallons roughly, give or take, you're gonna have plenty of room in there. And you know, it held it held the temperature for me uh, extremely well. I think I only dropped two degrees in that in that hour. And I have the optional sparge arm, so I gave a try at uh, fly sparging. I'm normally a batch sparge or or brew in a bag type of brewer. But I thought, what the heck, I'll give uh, the fly sparging a try. And probably went a little fast, but everything turned out okay. I was extremely happy with the uh, with the results, and uh, we'll taste the beer probably in the next week or two and see how that turned out. But, uh, boy, it's quite a beautiful piece of equipment. And, that is uh, a very nice-looking pot there. I mean, just yeah. sitting here staring at it, it's, uh, I mean, I like that you've got the uh, digital temperature gauge on the outside, too, so yep. that kind of gives you a better gauge as far as what you really got. Very nice. Uh, um, does your fly sparge arm have a valve control on it that you can control the full speed? No, but I do. On I, I took my old mash ton and I converted that to my as being my hot liquor tank, hmm. and I've got a ball valve on the end of that. And then I uh, I connected a I have a sous vide pump. It's just a small little pump that they use for uh, pumping hot water and stuff through uh, some type of French cooking. I just use it for as a small pump. Sure. And I just pumped my my uh, sparge water through there, and I closed the valve off a little bit to try to restrict the flow. And it's got uh, it's got some it's got some washers that go into the head of the of the sparge arm. And those there's three different sizes, and the the washers they're made of like a, a silicone, and they've got different gaps in them. So those gaps allow for various uh, flow speeds or flow flow rates. Okay. We've got like a wider channel, narrow channel, and then a very narrow channel. And which one were you using? I, I used I used the medium just to start out with to see if I'd have to go wider or smaller, and I think I'd have to go smaller next yeah. time. But um, well, between that and your your control and your and your washer, you probably nail it next time, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I was uh, I was very happy. It was a it was a <laughs> lot of fun using that thing. You know, SS Brutex, uh, a sponsor of uh, Brunology, so you know they're. Help you take care of us a little bit to to bring you guys some some good content. So, wanted to make sure we mentioned that their their product on there and it uh, really did did me justice good. last time. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That it's like I said, it's a very very nice looking mash tun. Yep. Just don't uh, don't think you if you buy this you could direct fire it because it's got it's got foam all over the top and the bottom. If you direct fire it, you'll ruin the mash tun. So yeah, not made for direct heat. No, it isn't. It says right. It says right in the instructions, by the way. I know, but who reads the instructions? We're men. That's a very good point. <laughs> How about you? Anything? Anything mm. new brewing related with you? No, I'm still on a still in a funk. I actually, I, I I do have something. I um I kegged my a couple of shows ago. I said I was going to make a Dunkelweiss, and and I actually lied. I I misquoted myself. I I made a Weizenbach. 
Okay. The one and, we just drank recently. Yeah, and we just recently drank that. I think it turned out exceptionally well. It was flipping delicious. Probably one of the best beers I've made in all the years I've tried. Yeah, it had nice chocolate notes to it. It it uh, it wasn't overly boozy. Uh, you know, the alcohol content was you know on the lower end for the style, which was nice because it wasn't hot. Yeah. You know, it had a very good mouthfeel. Um, nice estuary aroma to it. There wasn't a lot of clove. It was very very delicious. If we if we wouldn't have to sample. This Pilsner, after, probably would have had a little bit more, but we yeah. split a bottle of it. So. Yeah, I, fer- I fermented it at, uh, I think it was at 62. Okay. So I stayed right on the lower end. I know when you start getting into the uh, Bavarian yeast for that kind of stuff, that can be very sensitive to temperatures. If you go a little bit higher than 62, if you get up into 63, 64s, you're generally going to get more clove. You stay a little lower, you get the banana. Okay. I tried to find a happy medium where I was going to get a little bit of each, and I ended up leaning a little bit towards more towards banana, but I'm okay with that because I generally prefer that in my beers anyways over the cloves. I mean, me too. I'm not a big fan of cloves. No, so. it's it's nice if it's not overpowering, but that's very hard to do. You either get one or the other, or you get. And if it's clove, it's generally too much. Mm-hmm. So I would rather have a little bit more banana than anything, and and I think I did so. You did. You did an excellent job on that beer. Thank you. I, I didn't do it. The, the yeast did. I didn't. The yeast did. I didn't do. I didn't do nothing. You just fed them. I did. I just fed them. All I did was make some some sugar water for them, and they, there you go. So, uh, um, I wanted to take a, a moment this time too to uh, throw a little bit of uh, a shout out to Chris from Homebrewfinds dot com. Chris was nice enough to get the word for Brunology out for us on his Twitter feed and his Facebook page. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, very much. It got us uh, enough results from what I've seen off the off the links in the last, you know, the first forty eight hours or so afterwards were were fantastic. So got got the word out a little bit. Got at least people knowing that that we're there, and hopefully they're listening. And yeah, and uh, you know, if you in case you don't know what uh, what homebrewfinds dot com is, it's uh, it's not an RSS feed, but it's kind of set up like that where you get you go to you go to the page and he's got all kinds of pictures and articles and links to things. As far as if somebody spots a, a brewing deal, like, okay. like just for example, let's say if, if you were on Amazon looking for stuff and you happen to notice that Amazon's got the of glove that you would use for like mining a yeast starter. If they had that for six bucks or something and it was a deal, you could go to hit, go to homebrewfinds.com, click submit a tip, put your name, put the link to the, Amazon page and write up a little blurb about it and send it off. And if he publishes it on there, he'll give you credit for it. And it's, that's, it's kind of like a community thing where everybody just contributes and, and all he does is just put the stuff up there and, and. So it's all homebrew related deals, basically. Basically, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, they're doing all the legwork for you. Yeah. I found a lot of stuff on there that, that have been, you know, either lightning deals on Amazon or deals on, on vendor sites or something that, that they have. So it, it's a nice site. I, I recommend checking that out at least. Okay. So we're also on social media now. We're trying to get out to putting our presence out there a little bit more. We're out on, on Facebook. You can check out our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash brunology yep. with an EW. EW. Yep. Very important. Yep. And we do have a group. Um, if you go to our Facebook page, there is a link to the group. Um, the group is probably a little bit easier way to communicate with each other because when you have a page, and you post to the page. The only thing I don't like about it, and I'm sure you don't either, is it's not visible on the front page. And in a situation like this, you kind of want that stuff out where yep. anybody could see it and reply. So we also created a group. Yeah. So, Check us out there. We're also on uh, on Twitter. Twitter. Yep. At Brunology. B R E W N O L O G Y. Yep. So follow us on Twitter. Check us out on Facebook, uh, Brunology.com. Got any show ideas or, or feedback? Send it to feedback at Brunology.com. Are we still uh, taking samples? If if people wanted to send us a brew, are we going to do that? If somebody wants to send a sample and they want us to evaluate it, I say by all means, sure. Yeah, yeah. Up, why not? I'm up for that. Yeah, send a. If you want to send in a brew, send us an email to feedback at brunology dot com. Jason and I will check it out. Tell us if you want us to review it on the air or if you just want feedback in private. I guess. Yeah, we'll do it either way. Yeah, yeah. Um. So what uh, what do you got, Jason? You want to discuss anything? Uh, Topic one for our, our BJCP related topic is going to be fairly quick because we have a we have a pretty heavy duty uh, technical topic today, but um, basically I just wanted to talk a little bit about a, a judging kit. 
you know, when you go to a competition, you should always bring some utensils with you, some some tools to make your, you know, evaluation of the beer a little bit more easy. Um, some competitions, you know, they'll give you everything you need, be it pencils, paper, labels, everything. And you may not even have to bring anything. They may even have guidelines for you. But it doesn't hurt to have your own personal stash of things, you know, because sometimes the openers they give you don't work that well, to be quite honest. You know, they're, they're, they're cheap sometimes. In some cases, some cases are really nice, but some cases they don't work so well. So in my kit, what I bring with me to every competition is I have a, I have, as you can see, it's hanging up over there. It's just a small, I think they call it a neck wallet. Yeah, I call it a small man purse. It's like a little pulse. Like. Yep. And on it, I have a, you can see it. I have a uh, bottle opener and I have a small flashlight. So that I have a bottle opener that I know works well, and I have a small flashlight for dim lit situations. Inside, I also have a few extra mechanical pencils as well as standard pencils. You have to be careful with standard pencils, you know, the kind that you sharpen, because some people are really sensitive to that wood smell. Mm. So I prefer to write with a standard pencil as opposed to a mechanical. So I'll ask the judge across from me, are you really sensitive to, to wood shavings and things like that? And if they say no, I say, do you mind if I use a regular pencil? Because that's what I prefer. And uh, if they don't, then I'll use uh, mechanical pencils, and most of the time those are provided. I also have an SRM card that you get from the BJCP when you pass your exam. I have my judging badge, even though I have my number by heart. It's got your name on it, so if you're in a place that has a lot of judges you don't know, it's kind of like a little name tag as well. I have an extra eraser, and because I keep my guidelines on either a tablet or on my phone, Instead of carrying the big bulky notebook or, or binder with me, um, I have a small portable charging station that's for my phone or tablet that I can just, it's like an extra battery pack, and I plug it in with a cable. So if my phone or tablet starts getting low on juice, I just plug in that extra battery. And then I have uh, extra labels for score sheets, which saves time in labeling your sheets. You know, they're just little Avery address labels, and you put your name, your BJCP ID, and your email information on there, carry that with you in your judging kit, and that should be all all you need. You well, should never have to bring glasses or any of that stuff. And I believe that for the labels, I believe if you go out to the BJCP website, I believe they have the Avery template for that on there with the BJCP logo. Correct. So all you have to do is just download that, put that into your word editing software, and print your labels on that. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I know. That, that's what I use. I think we do enough writing when it comes to... The, the the score sheets. I think if you can save yourself a couple of arthritic moments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, the more the merrier. But those are all very good things. I uh, I like the point you made about the mechanical pencils versus the the regular pencils. I, I'm not a fan of the mechanical pencils myself either. But the tips break. I don't know if it, if you I can't push press really hard. You can't press real hard because yeah. they 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 snap off, and then you're sitting there going click click click. Yeah, and then you write a little bit, and it snaps off. Click click click. Mm -hmm. That's almost more annoying than somebody sitting in front of you sharpening their pencil. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's why I prefer the standard pencils. They don't seem to break as easy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But good stuff. Um, those, that portable charging thing, to, that's, those are kind of nice. I've got probably two or three of those myself, too. And once I get my exam stuff ready and then get my ID and everything, I'm going to put a kit together, too. So I'm definitely going to throw one of them in there. Perfect. So I'd like to take this time. We'll talk a little bit about homebrewtalk.com. They're a sponsor of ours. Homebrewtalk.com. Yep. Uh, right now they have a giveaway going on. If you're a if you're a supporting member, and you put your name into the hat, uh, they they do a lot of giveaways around Christmas time. Oh yeah, a lot and, of them. And so if you become a supporting member, and you can do so for like as little as like four dollars a month. Yeah. That's um, that that's for a monthly subscription. You can you can save money if you go to like. A little bit of a longer... Yeah, I think you can go by month or you can go by year or you can go lifetime if you want. Yeah. Um, right now they have a giveaway going on if you're a supporting member that, that they're also going to be doing several other um, giveaways before Christmas. So yeah. In the next coming weeks and weeks around the holidays, they're going to be doing a, like one a week, I think they said. I think they do that every year. Yep. Yeah, around the holiday times, I know in the past when I followed that, they, uh, they've always put stuff on there. And I think they recently just gave away like a, an AMCYL kettle mm -hmm. um, and i think the 15 recipes that they're doing from homebrew supply i think i read somewhere that that's like their top 15 recipe kits from the year or mm -hmm. the top 15 recipes that they've sold for the year or something like that so it's not 
bottom feeding stuff that they're trying to get rid of or anything. It's good stuff. Oh, they give away stuff like kettles and conicals and, and you know, temperature controllers. They give away a lot of really nice stuff. Yeah, they you, do. You do have to be a supporting member to enter, but yeah. But it's I mean, worth it. They need the support anyway, so absolutely, you should be do. supporting them anyways. Yep. So please check them out. I know I support them. Yep. So. They're helping us out. Uh, we want to help them out as well. So send, you know, check them out. If you want to try to get your hands on some free stuff, think about becoming a supporting member and I know I put uh, I put a, a a post up there a couple of days ago for Brunology.com to try and get the word out to the community on Homebrew Talk too. So just a nice little springboard that you can use for things like that, and you can go out there and, and get your get your homebrew questions answered and everything else too. I mean, it's there's a lot of useful information on there. There's a lot of people on there that know a heck of a lot of stuff. So mm-hmm. all right, well, what do you have for us today for our style of the episode? Well, the style of the episode this week is going to be. Um, 3B, 2015 guidelines, 3B, uh, check premium pale lager. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to do something, uh, I wanted to do a check pills and, and check pills falls into the 3B category for 2015. So I found a Sierra Nevada makes a beer called a nooner. It's a, it doesn't say it's a check pills, but I read their website and their website says that it's, it's, Got Moravian floor malted barley, um, saz hops, soft water, low mineral content. So to me, that tells me they were trying to make a, a check pills without actually calling it a check pills. Okay. So their can just says Pilsner, but um, and we cracked it open just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I'm sure you heard Jason crack that. And it sounded cool through the headphones. Really did sound good through the headphones. <laughs> I don't know how it came through. It's going to come through in the audio. But I hope it comes through because it was awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we opted for the cans instead of the bottles. But uh, no chance of getting light struck there. No, no, perfect. So aroma, what are you getting there, Jason? I get a, a little bready malt. Uh, it's grainy, grainy and bready. Um, so you know that you know that's that complex maltiness that's in there. You know, it's more than more than just one dimensional. Yep. Um, for me, the the size comes through a little a little floral. Uh, it, you know, generally they come across spicy, but to me these were these were feeling a little more floral. Um, the Aroma is very clean, you know. I know in the 2008 guidelines, at least the the bow pills could have a little bit of diacetyl in it, but I don't get anything in here, which is which is fine. Just because it can have it doesn't mean it has to have it, right? But um, I just think this fermentation uh, smells very clean. It's a it's a nice malty. There's a nice hop aroma to it, and so it's, it's a little high, uh, but very good. What about you? Um, I'm kind of with you. I'm picking up the grainy, um, light bready aroma. I'm, I'm actually calling the hops a little more spicy than I am floral. Um, for me, they're kind of balancing very nicely with the, with the malt. You know, you get a little bit of the graininess and then you get a little bit of the hops. So I'm, I'm getting really good balanced aromatics out of this. I'm not picking up any DMS, diacetyl, off flavors. Um, it's very clean. Like you said, a very clean fermentation. So, um, just the aroma. The aroma alone tells me it's going to be a good beer because it's it's very well done. It's clean, so yep. it's it's the color is pale yellow. I'll pour myself a little more. It's pale yellow and it it's very slightly hazy, but I mean it is very clear. I would never ding that clarity, but I'm it's not brilliantly clear. It's, no, there's a slight haze to it. Yep. It's a brilliant, very clear clarity. It says dense, long lasting, creamy white head. Uh, I did get I did get that uh, the head is very long lasting. I, I gave it uh, very good points for appearance. It is slightly lighter than the gold, as the guidelines say, but to me it's more yellow. Yeah. What about the flavor? Um, flavor for me, I, I picked up a lot of that hop spice that came through initially. Um, picking up the the graininess, uh, the mild maltiness came through. Um, again, I didn't pick up any off flavors. It was crisp. It finished clean, um, except for the, the lingering bitterness from the hops, which you'd expect. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I didn't pick up any flaws whatsoever. It was a, a very flavorful, um, enjoyable beer. I agree that the, the beer was very crisp. I actually uh, even called the malt flavor to it crisp, almost like it's like a almost like it's slightly uh, biscuity in mm-hmm. a way. And uh, I thought I thought it was very well bittered. The bitterness is is nice and 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 in your face, but it's not overdone. I thought uh, it has a nice f- uh, floral hop flavor as well for me. Um, it, uh, the beer starts out malty, uh, finishes bitter. So to me, it's almost a little bit like a teeter totter act, which 
goes back and forth, back and forth. So, you know, to me, that was a good balance. Balance doesn't always have to be strictly even, but the two need to be in, in, in uh, cohesion with each other. Yeah, they got to work together. Yeah. And, and, you know, one wasn't dominating the other. It's like they were battling back and forth the, between bitterness and sweetness. Um, and again, the flavor was very, a very clean fermentation uh, for me. It is the bitterness and the, or not the bitterness, but the, the hop presence to me was a little bigger than what I expect usually in a Czech pills. Um, but I like it. So, um, again, just a little, a little bit high. That'd be my only critique on the hop presence of it. But it's American. I mean, we tend to always go a little overboard on the hops. Which, yeah. Which is fine. No, I, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ding it for that because I don't think it's out of style, it's out of style, it's out of character. I think it, it works. Um, just because, like you said, it's got the balance with the teeter totter effect. It's got a little bit of the malt. It's got a little bit of the hops. It's kind of brings you back and forth. It doesn't finish strong one way or the other. So it, I mean, it, for the mouthfeel, I've got it as a, as a medium carbonation. Um, mm-hmm. it's not, too. it's not or, but it's, it's slightly creamy almost in, in its texture. Which is kind of odd considering how crisp it is, yeah. but it's uh, it's almost like mildly effervescent. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's yeah. I, I consider this medium bodied. I also gave it a moderate carbonation, and I, I I I say it's got a low a low creamy texture as well. That comes from the dextrins in there as well. I can add to that creamy uh, feel to it. No astringency. It's, it's very nice. Very nice feeling on the palate. I can have myself some more of that. That's, yeah. yeah. Um, overall impressions, I, I thought uh, I thought it was a very good example of the style. I thought it had good balance of hops and malt. It was clean. Um, it was uh, didn't have any noticeable flaws or anything. It nope. was I, g- I gave it a thirty nine. I'm at thirty seven. Okay. So I, I think we're good there. I mean, I'm at the to- I'm at the very top of uh, of very good and. <laughs> I, I thought it was an excellent beer, but it wasn't world class for me because the hops were a little more assertive. You know, they they can be moderate, they can be high, but I thought these were just a little too too high. So that is that would be my only critique of it. But that doesn't mean that it's not a fantastic beer. I thought it was excellent. Well, and who knows? I mean, that could go back to like we had that one uh, that one podcast of of uh, of Goza, I believe it was, where we weren't sure about the can because of the age. Right. So, I mean, this may be an older sample. I don't know, but I mean, um, but it could be could be an older example, I guess, if you really want to get technical with it. But I say, if you're looking for a good Czech Pils in America, grab yourself a Sierra Nevada Nooner. I I think it's a good enough beer that you could probably don't just enjoy it at noon. No, you can have that throughout the day. That's uh, that's a good everyday beer, you know, all around. So, good job. Just wanted to go into a little bit of. Uh, brief history about the uh, about the the beer itself the the Czech pills obviously uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, Joseph Grohl initially brewed two types of beer in, in 1842 or 1843 um, I'm not gonna try and pronounce the beers names because I don't speak that and I'm not gonna butcher it and do it any injustice but uh, it was a smaller beer and a large beer basically and uh, the smaller beer having twice the production uh, Evan Rail speculates that these were probably 10 Plato to 12 Plato beers. Um, and one was a little weaker. This is the uh, most consumed type of beer in the Czech Republic at the present time. Uh, the birth of Pilsner beer can be traced back to its namesakes, the ancient city of Pilsen, which is situated on the western half of Czech Republic in what had, was once known as Czechoslovakia, is previously part of the Bohemian Kingdom. Uh, Pilsner beer was the first was first brewed back in the 1840s when the citizens, brewers, and maltsters of Pilsen formed a brewer's guild and called it the uh, People's Brewery of Pilsen. So 1840s, um, here we are, 2015. So that is one heck of an old-style beer. So yep. uh, appreciate uh, Sierra Nevada trying to, and all the other brewers who make one, trying to bring that back and keep it going. So I think they did a good job. Yeah. Um, I guess at this time I want to take a little moment to uh, bring up another sponsor. I think uh, we kind of mentioned them before, but uh, homebrewsupply.com. Mm-hmm. Homebrewsupply.com, like Jason mentioned earlier, is uh, kind of going to have a little 
giveaway session with, with homebrewtalk.com where they're going to give away 15 recipes, uh, kits to supporting members. But they also have something on their site called the Recipe Builder, which I, I wanted to kind of plug a little bit because I, I kind of played around with it the other day and I'm still in a funk, so I didn't really order anything, but I did put some stuff around on it. And it's, it's kind of neat because when you shop around on their site, you, you put everything in your cart, your yeast, your grains, your everything and go to check out and it's, it's all there. Yeah. You can actually formulate your recipe on their website. Yep. You know, play around with it, get your OG, you know, your IBUs and all that. You can create and then you just hit add to cart and it will add. Grabs everything you need. Whatever, whatever items you created from your recipe, it'll, it'll add that in. So yep. that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I did like that. Custom feature. recipes every time. Yep. That's uh, it's a nice feature to have and, and I believe you can save them. And then okay. you can you can go ahead and call them up again if you need to when you create your account, and I think you can save a couple on there. So check that out, uh, homebrewsupply.com. I, I think they're running a seven ninety nine flat rate shipping fee on obviously not full sacks of grain, but uh, some exclusions apply. But it's awesome seven ninety nine flat rate shipping. So you picked you picked a very interesting topic today for us to talk about uh, as far as our technical topic. You really wanted to tackle a big one this time, I can see, and you wanted to talk about the mash. I did. So we can talk about the mash. All right. <clears throat> Mashing. It's yep. uh it's not just people stepping on grapes. Oh wait, that's No. No, no that's just that's the wine, wine that's just the wine guys. That's the wine guys. Yeah. We're beer guys. We don't do that. Nope. Um I guess when we're talking about the mash, we should talk about the different types of mash. Um, you have your infusion mashing, which is what most of us do. Uh, that's just it's essentially it's just mixing grain at a single temperature, you know, for the entire mash. That requires minimum labor, minimum equipment. You know, you can do brew in a bag with a single single infusion, um, and it saves time. It's it's not ideal for under modified malts, you know, like uh, some of your old world pilsners or like even things like rye or wheat. Or those, you know, the high protein content malts, you still may want to do uh, step mashing or decoction mashing with those types of grains. But for a big, huge portion of your of your you know brewing library, you can use a single step infusion. Uh, another another type of mashing is called step mashing. That's where you mash in uh, at a lower temperature. Generally, these days people will start at, at the protein rest, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then you raise the temp uh, through uh, water additions or through direct heating um, to utilize the various enzymes uh, more efficiently. So you're you're hitting different different temperature ranges that those that those enzymes work best at. Alphas, betas. Yep, yeah. yep. And it, it requires more time and labor than just a single infusion, uh, but it's a, it's good for using with under modified malts or, or wheats or rye, especially if you're going to do like a, a protein rest with a wheat or rye to try to break apart those um, the, the proteins that encapsulate the starch molecules within those type of grains more so than your, your fully modified grains. Um, decoction mashing is basically the same as step mashing except how you raise your temperature. With step mashing, you're just either adding water or you're doing like a direct fire. With decoction mashing, you're pulling out uh, one-third of the thick portion of the mash. You're bringing that to a boil. Then you add it back to um, mash to the mash to raise temperatures. So generally, you know, you'll start at say uh, the the protein rest, you know, and then you will pull out a third of that thick portion of mash, and then you'll boil it. You'll add it back in, and you'll get into like the the beta amylase uh, phase. And you'll pull out a portion, you'll boil that, add it, and try to get into the alpha amylase. Or you can go acid rest protein sacrification, you know, however you want, because you can do a decoction mashing up to three times. And basically what it does is it explodes the starch granules, breaks down the protein matrix of the under-modified malts, which helps improve efficiency and promotes melanoidins. And it can also, if done right, which that's, that's the hard part, it can, it can, um, give you, you know, really good clarity and some, you know, like a rye beer or something. But the problem is, is if you do it wrong, you do a protein rest for too long, it can actually degrade your beer, especially, you know, like head and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, then you have cereal mashing or double mashing, which is what people will use a lot of times if they're using uh, corn or rice. You know, if they're not using like the flaked or the the flaked um, corn or flaked rice, you have to do a cereal mash. Which basically, what you do is you uh, you boil that you boil that cereal, you know, the the corn and the rice with a little bit of grain for one hour, 
and then you just add that whole thing to your main mash, and that that um, cereal mash breaks apart all of the the proteins and explodes, you know, all of the the, the protein matrix and releases the starches to be converted in your main mash. So, out of those styles, um, how many of those have you attempted in your in your years? I've never done decoction mashing. I have not wanted to to do the pulling of the thick portion of the mash. I kind of want to do it now, but it, when I think about my brew day, that's a long day. Um, but I, I have tasted decocted beers, and while it doesn't really necessarily always make the beer better, it does add a certain richness to the to the flavor of the beer that I just think you can't really duplicate, even with, like, melanoid malt. You know, you get those rich melanoids in, like, a, a nice decocted Doppelbach or, you know, like a Pilsner, you know, Another one that's decocted can uh, generally is a, uh, a German Hefeweizen. Yep. So you know you get that nice richness that I. It's just so labor intensive. I haven't done it. I generally do infusion mashing, and actually the beer that is fermenting behind you, I did step mash. Oh, you did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that your first time step mashing? No, I've done it twice before, but it's a long day. Yeah. So I don't. I don't usually do step mashing. I actually did do it just recently. Just because you wanted to or because? Just because I wanted to. Yeah. I felt like I wanted a longer brew day, <laughs> so I said I'm going to step mash today. Well, it was a nice day outside, wasn't it? It you, was. You want to enjoy the weather. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Back to the weather again. So how about you? Have you ever done any of the other ones? Um, no. I've I've tried to oh. figure a way to justify a step, match, step mash in my brew days and... With the modified malts that we have nowadays, I just can't justify the extra wasted time. Yeah. Um, so I'm just an infusion mash guy. It, well, one thing I do want to mention is with a step mash and decoction mash, when you are doing a protein rest, make it a short rest. You know, Because, like you said, the, the grains are, are well modified, yeah. and a protein rest shouldn't be long in the first place. But, I mean, we're talking less than 15 minutes at the protein rest before you're starting to raise that temperature. So... But all of this is pretty meaningless unless we start talking about the enzymes in the mash. And we should, we should, as judges and as brewers, we should understand what enzymes are active and what, what function they play in the brewing of beer so that you can understand and you can make adjustments and you know what's going on within the mash other than just saying, I'm just going to add hot water to my grain and I'm going to make beer. Yeah. That, that works. It, it works for many people, but if you ever want to make adjustments or if you want to understand why something maybe might not be working out the way that you expect it to, it's always good to have knowledge of what the various functions do and how they affect your beer. So that's that's what we're trying to bring in. So the first set of mash enzymes, which is very rarely used in today's day and age, is um, your acetic enzymes. And those are activated uh, between 95 degrees and 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, these are the phytase, which breaks down phytin into calcium, magnesium phosphate, and phytic acid, and this helps acidify the mash. The second one in that same uh, temperature range, this is during the acid rest phase, is your beta-glucanase. Uh, those break down the, the hemicellulose and gums in the cell wall of the undermodified malts, you know, and things like wheat and rye, things like that. So that is why um, an acid rest is actually a very good rest to use for a short period of time on your rye beers because it helps uh, prevent a stuck mash by working on those gums and the hemicellulose that's around the cell walls of the rye and then you're you're you know it's basically degrading those proteins that cause the stuck ma- stuck mash and how long would you do an acidic mash for then if you say short time 10 uh, 15 minutes at so we're still the, at under the most. The, we're still under the 15 minute then. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think traditionally it used to be a lot longer, like an hour or so, but we're not, we're not really looking as much to acidify our mash because we're doing it either through water or, you know, the type of grains we're adding, or you can always add acid. But back when they used to have to use all of these steps, they didn't really know why the stuff worked as well. They didn't understand enzymes like brewers do today. Yeah. You know? So, you know, the acid, the, the phytase isn't as important if you're going to do it. So I, I'd be shooting to, to to get that beta-glucanase working on the rye, if you're using rye. 
I wouldn't use an acid rest for really any other beer style today. No, just rye? No. But it is good information to have so that you understand what's working at that temperature range. The next are the protolytic enzymes. Those are at about 113 degrees to 127 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 to 52 degrees Celsius. And what's the, there's many, 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 many enzymes working, uh, on proteins during the mash. But there's two main ones that we're mostly concerned with. And those are your proteinase, which breaks down proteins into smaller polypeptides that are necessary for good head retention and peptidase. Peptidase, which breaks down polypeptides into peptides and amino acids that are essential for proper yeast growth and development. But again, too long of a protein rest in today's fully modified malts, and you're actually going to start hurting things like your head retention. Because as peptidase breaks down the polypeptides, as you, you know, as you can see, what we talked about with the proteinase breaks down the proteins into polypeptides that are necessary for good head retention, as I just said. Peptidase, if, if you were, you know, just listening, breaks down polypeptides. And that's in the same, that's in the same, uh, temperature range. So there's a balance there that you really have to be careful of. And it breaks down those polypeptides that are, that are necessary for good head retention. And it breaks them down into peptides and amino acids that the yeast use. So you break down too many polypeptides. You don't have good head retention. You don't have enough. And you don't have enough uh, amino acids for uh, proper yeast growth and development. Next is the, the the big the big daddy that everybody worries about. This is the one that we get into when we're working a single step infusion. And these are your your diastatic enzymes, your beta amylase and your alpha amylase. They together are active in a range between 130 degrees and 158 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 54 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, beta amylase uh, generally becomes most active between 130 degrees and 150 degrees Fahrenheit, or 54 degrees Celsius to, 60, to 65 degrees Celsius. And what beta amylase does is it breaks off uh, sugar units from, from the reducing ends of the starch molecule, uh, creating simple sugars. And I'm not going to go through all the simple sugars that it creates because, you know, we don't need to need, really know that for any testing. But what you do need to know is that, you know, think of it like Pac-Man going, going down this molecule, starch molecule, and it's breaking off all the reducing ends. Those are the, the, the tips. And it's taking off like a unit, a unit of, um, of sugar. And it's, it's just attacking that starch, creating a very simple sugar. Those simple sugars are very easy for the yeast to consume. They'll fully ferment those out. They can consume them. So that, that is why you, will usually end up with a more fermentable wort and you'll end up with higher alcohol and a thinner body because you don't have as much residual sugar and, and starches left behind. So that's why we also need to work in tandem with our beta amylase. We need an alpha amylase, which becomes most active between 149 degrees Fahrenheit and 158 degrees Fahrenheit to 65 degrees to 70 degrees Celsius. And what alpha amylase does is it breaks off the, the one to four links from each starch molecule at random. So it's, um, I like to think of it as, as the wild and crazy axe murderer that's <laughs> just running around, swinging an axe, it's chopping off an arm, it's chopping off a leg. It doesn't care. No, it's just, you know, between one to four links, it, anything in there is game. So it creates uh, both simple and complex sugars, um, and it tends to leave uh, less fermentable wort for the yeast because you've got some of those more complex sugars that the yeast can't consume. Now, the way that we control that, you know, a lot of times, like what, what would you say would be the average mash temperature that you're usually looking to hit for like a, a medium body beer, like right in the middle? I usually try to aim for like 151, 152. Yep, that's exactly right. It's usually about where I try to be. And as you can see from the, the temperatures that I gave, beta amylase is most active between 130 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't mean at 150.1 it denatures. That just means that's its optimum range. Right. And same thing with alpha amylase. You know, it's it starts at 149. And it goes up to 158. Doesn't mean it immediately denatures at 158.1. So you have a little bit of overlap at that 149 to 150 range, but 151, 152 
it kind of tilts you a little bit more into the alpha. So you do end up with a nice medium body beer. It's not overly light. It's not overly fermentable. Yep. Once you start getting 154, 156, now you're leaning even heavier into the alpha. Now you're getting a full-bodied beer. Right. You lean further, 150, 148, 147, yeah. very light. And yep. if, you, if you've got a really bad mash and you're at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to have an extremely fermentable beer. It's going to be extremely light-bodied. It's probably going to taste alcoholic. And it's going to probably dry out. Be very dry. Yep. 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 Um, no, that's that's good. That's a good point. Do you have any questions so far? I don't. Um, yeah. I'm just. Uh, I mean, I, I hope we're not. I hope we're not losing anybody with the technical terms and all the all the. Well, we we still want to provide them. Yeah. But I know. For me, I glaze over sometimes with that stuff, but. Right. So I, I think they're good topics, and and I think uh, maybe we should put these uh, these notes someplace on Brunology.com. I can put them in the show notes yeah, for the episode. Maybe we should do that mm-hmm. so that people got this information because I know that's a lot to uh, a lot to absorb, especially if it's something of your first, second, third times hearing it. It's got to sink in a little bit. And so. I and I know because you know we're limited. We're trying to limit ourselves with time a little bit. We don't want these to go for like an hour and a half. Yeah, I'm talking very fast. Right. So I will I will put these out on on the the web. Yeah, I think that's a good do that. But now we're going to tie all those things I just talked about together with the way the enzymes work and our mashing methods. And we're going to talk about the mash steps. Now, you have doughing in, and generally speaking, you're going to be looking at 10 to 15 degrees higher than your desired starting temperature. So, for example, you'd be looking at 160 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit to come into about 150 degree uh, rest temperature. And that's all dependent upon your grain temp your mash ton temp, and your ambient temp. Right. That's why I say generally yeah. speaking. But, I mean, in Wisconsin, we've got winter coming up here where we're going to have some colder weather, and if you're an outside brewer, you're probably going to have to take that 10 to 15 and maybe go 20, 25. Yep. Just just to give yourself that little extra that you're going to need because otherwise you are going to be down in that 130, 135 range probably, and that's not where you want to be. So That's where Beersmith comes in really handy. Yep. Because you can you can plug in. There's like a little checkbox, you know, cal- uh, adjust mash temperature for for equipment temperature, and you can put. Well, my equipment is at 62. You know, that's it's been outside. Outside is 62. My equipment is at 62, yep. and it will make those adjustments for you. Yeah, that's that's another good point. Is using Beersmith that does make a, um, things easier on a brew day. So you bet that's, it does. That's a good point. So essentially, uh, some people think doing it is an actual step. Um, because it's usually listed as a step, but really doing in all it is is just adding the water to your grain. It's more of an action than a step. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, next, as we talked about, was the acid rest, which takes place at 95 degrees to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 to 50 degrees Celsius. And um, that utilizes the phytase and the beta gluconase, as I mentioned earlier, which you really don't have to do in today's day and age, but it's good knowledge to have. Uh, protein rest, that is your, your next uh, mash step if you're doing a full-on step mash. And that occurs at 113 to 127 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can see, there is some overlap as well. So if you're if you're doing a protein rest at like 120-ish, you're going to be doing both an acid rest and protein rest anyway. And just keep it short. But the protein rest utilizes the protolytic enzymes that work on proteins in the beer uh, to produce better head and clearer beer, as I mentioned earlier, as long as it's done correctly. 10 to 15 minutes. At the most. At the most. With fully modified malts. You know, with I, you don't even have to do a protein rest with fully modified malts. But, I mean, if you do want to play around with it, keep it very short. Yeah. Well, it may be something you want to do to, you know, style and compare. You know, do one, yeah. one, one way and one another way and, you know, make yourself a, a one or two gallon, three gallon test batch of something one way and then do it again another way and, See if you can taste the differences. Yeah. See if you see if one actually comes out worse. See if that step mash came out worse. You know, did did the protein rest actually hurt your beer? Yeah. You know, because I I think with today's fully modified malts, in in most cases, it it can. You know, it's a very touchy. You know, when I did I did that step mash just because I wanted to, but the way that I do a step mash is I mash in at um, you know 127 degrees or so. That's where I mash in, but I'm immediately raising up. I've got hot water ready to go. So that's where I start and I go up. So I'm, I'm just basically starting there and slowly ramping 
when I do my step mash. I'm not actually putting it in, letting it sit for 15 minutes, and then adding. So I'm just that's just where I'm starting at. Uh, next is the sacrification rest. That's you know as we talked about before with the the amylase enzymes, 130 to 158 degrees for the full range. Uh, this is this is the one step that we look to with a single infusion mash. This converts starches to sugars. Uh, generally, you want a balance between a good balance between beta amylase and alpha amylase, as as we talked about. So look at look to be about 150 to 152 for a balanced medium body beer. Adjust slightly towards beta for a lighter body, slightly towards alpha for more full body. Uh, too far in one direction will lead to the beer being either too thin, alcoholic, or you know, or too watery, or to be too sweet and full body. Oh, those are those are good points. I think sacrification is probably what everybody and most of the general public tends to to do. So, yep, it's good to cover that too. Yeah. You know, the main thing is you you really need to pay attention to what what you want as far as a light you know medium light medium body full bodied and and make your adjustments there as far as your your temperature to where you want it to be yeah. you know don't stick with just one i always mash at 152 period you know just don't not every beer style needs to be medium body right so you may miss i mean if you're entering competitions or if you're making something that you want to be world class you may miss the the, the guidelines for the style for that beer if you don't adjust your mash temps. Right. It may be so. a little, little too sweet, a little too dry if you're, you know, depending on what it is. So that, that's why this information is important so that you can understand why you need to maybe adjust temperatures here and there and don't always have one specific temperature for every single beer that you do. Yep. And it also helps you provide feedback. If a beer is maybe right. too sweet Perfect, or too yeah. full bodied, you can you can provide that feedback on maybe you mashed a little too high or you mashed a little too low, and then you can give those temperature ranges that you could suggest that they. Yep. That they part, of, at. part of your uh, your feedback on your score sheet then, if you want to. Correct. You know, say hey, this was a little too uh, too thin on the body. Maybe up your mash temp next time. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. It's good points. Just a, a quick overview of what it takes to to obtain that kind of thing is uh, the grains modified modern malts. Starches converge. They, you want the the starches to be converted into sugars, so um, that'll be used in the fermentation process. The, the yeast are going to eat the sugars, so the grains are to be crushed in a mill uh, or with a rolling pin if you really want. Um, I, I know I've seen people doing that too, where you put them in like a flour sack or in between a towel or something, and you take a rolling pin and you roll them over the top, um, crush them out. You don't want to pulverize them, but you want to open up and um, open the husks up and, and get the uh, Expose the inside so you can get the starches that you need for that conversion. Uh, different sugars are created at different temps, like Jason said. So I mean, there's a huge list of sugars. I I don't have them memorized. No, there there is a huge list, and and we didn't get into that. But I mean, we can certainly put that in the show notes if somebody wants that. But it it, it is a lot of different sugars that get into that. But I, generally speaking, for for the sacrification and and most of the 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 general malts. Uh, you want to be in the like the 148 to 156, right? About there, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go over 156. No, I wouldn't go above 156 I, or I, below 148. Yeah. Um, you end up with a, a an optimal range there for for converting the sugars. Uh, generally speaking, I don't know with today's modern malts. There's a coin flip on what you can do and how long it takes. I've seen people do 15 minute mashes, but I, I generally do an hour. Yeah, I, I've read that as well, and and I know. Years back, when I was first taking the BJCP course in like, it was 2005 or 2004, and one of the guys that was putting on the course for us was, at the time, he was the head brewer at Titletown Brewing Company up in Green Bay. He was not there anymore, but at the time he was, and he was very adamant that brewers do not have to do a mash any longer than 15 minutes. Now, that sunk into my brain a little bit. I still could never bring myself to do it because I thought, I don't know. I just, it, from all conventional wisdom and all that everybody talks about, it always seems too short. But I've seen online, yep. people are doing it and they're doing the, doing the conversion check and, and they're having success with it. Right. So I, I just, mean, I just personally can't bring myself to do it. I can't either. It just doesn't feel right. Well, it doesn't hurt anything to do it for an hour. No. Um, and, and like, it, especially it costs more time. Well, it costs more time. Exactly. But I mean, you're out there already dedicating an afternoon to a brew day or whatever. So what's, 
another couple of minutes, but um, generally I just I I do an hour. Um, yep, me too. I, I, unless I'm doing like a, like a cream ale or something, then I'll do an hour and a half. But generally the uh, the one hour and the result um, you're going to get is going to be based on your temperatures. So uh, depending on where you're mashing at, you know, obviously like Jason said, the the lower temperature you're going to get the thinner bodied beer. The higher temperatures you're going to get the the more full bodied beer. The uh, the starches they get converted into sugars, extract them. Uh, there's another method after this called called laudering, and I don't really want to get into that because this is kind of about the mashing, but um, generally what you do with the laudering is you take the, the grains and stuff that you've been mashing for an hour and you you take off a little sample and you, you pour it back over the top of the grain bed. You, that, that's you, a Vorloff. A Vorloff, I'm sorry. Right. So, yeah. But you're right, laudering is still part of that. Yeah. So um, so then you're, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to get all of the sugars that you can out of that mash, you know, every little possible sugar molecule that you can. Um, so you raise the temperature on that afterwards so that you can basically stop that conversion process. Mashing out. Mashing out. That's a step I forgot. Very good. Yeah. So Thank when you for covering that. No, that's, that's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Missed mashing out. So yeah, mashing out, you basically, you raise it. I, I usually do like 168 to 170. Somewhere in there, depending again in the winter time in Wisconsin, you may want to go a little higher because you, you definitely want to get up there in that upper 160s range to consider you're going to lose a little bit of heat when you transfer. So you want to be in the upper end of the 160, 161, 2. I don't mash out. You don't mash out? I don't mash out. I don't. I, um, my mash out is heating my work to a boil. That's my mashing out. Really? Well, I figure, you know, when I, mean, I, 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 I say really, but I mean, I, I mean, it's a, it's a logical step. I mean, you're saving yourself some time on your brew day and you're probably getting the same results. Yeah. Cause the, the way I look at it is, you know, if I, if I, if, if I'm mashing for an hour or I'm draining and I'm mashing for an hour and 15 minutes as that wort heats up, it's really not making that big of an impact or, or some big difference. So I, I just, I drain, I sparge and I, boil hmm. i don't do a mash out but i know a lot of people do and they, there are they claim there are benefits to it but i guess that's just like the primary versus doing a secondary right. argument yeah you know, and that, what, what works for you and that's a different show we can get into that but um yeah generally i i do the i do the um uh, i do that that uh, i i've actually probably almost exclusively switched to brew in a bag Yes, um, which I did too up until recently. Which is kind of nice because of the fact that I can take and I can put a false bottom in my pot. I can put it in my burner, and I can put my grains in there, and I can get my my rest. And like I said before, Wisconsin in the winter, brew out my garage. If I'm gonna mash in and I want to hit 152, 151, I'm not gonna do that with 30 degrees outside. So in order to get that temperature back up, I know with the brew in the bag and the full spot, I can put my grains in there. I can, if I need some heat, I'll just turn on the burner for 30 seconds until I see the needle move and raise it up in temperature, put the lid back on and, and call it done. Do that as needed for my hour. And then when it comes time to, to mash out, I'll actually just take it and I'll put, uh, I'll raise it up to 165, 166, and let that sit for a little bit, and seven, eight, ten minutes, whatever, and then extract my sugars and start boiling. But it's it's nice to be. I, I like the brew in a bag method when it comes to this kind of stuff because it, it does give me that extra safety net of temperature control, which I really kind of enjoy. I don't know that it makes a difference in my beers, but for me, it makes myself feel better about how I do it because I know the coolers. I've got, I've got so much brewing equipment. My wife gets so pissed off at all the stuff I got. <laughs> yeah. She actually just gave up and, and gave me the garage and said, "We're never putting a car in there again. Here's your garage. Just put all your brew stuff out there." That's what it's all about. Which is great, but now I've got so much damn stuff that it's just whatever. Yeah, um, whole different show, and possibly therapy session. But that's just me. Sure. So yeah, that's basically mashing. Uh, Jason is going to put the the notes, or we'll put the notes on on Brunology dot com, and because I know things went a little faster, we wanted to keep the show short, and I think we're probably a little uh, probably a little over our time already. So I cut this off and uh, talk to you guys in a couple of weeks. I think, huh? Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to check us out on Brunology dot com. Check us out on Facebook. 
Check us out on Twitter. Email us if you have any show out notes or ideas. You want to send us some beer or feedback at brunology.com. I'm Dean Winch. That's Jason Johnson. It's another week. Thanks, everybody. Boom. Boom. <laughs>